Welcome, everyone. So happy to have you here on a cold day. Um, this is our first CARLA presentation of the spring semester, and we're happy to have you here. We're also taping this this time, so we're, um, this is kind of an experiment for us because we have not done a lot of taping of our presentations, but we thought, you know, we do such great things, share such great information, why not share it nationally as one of the language resource centers? Um, if you haven't signed in yet, if you could do so um, on your way out, that's, that would be great. Um, and before I introduce our speaker today, I also want to just let you know that we have some um, flyers out there that has the information about the next presentation on uh, using mobile assisted language learning. Um, and that's going to be next Wednesday, and it will be in Nolte 140. So don't come here, go to Nolte 140. We are really excited to have Colleen Myers here. She's an educational specialist at the Center for Educational Innovation. She herself says that that uh, unit has changed names many times. I think of her as being a part of the TA program. Um, she's been here, she's a veteran educational specialist and we're happy to have her here talking about her very famous mirroring project. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to be here today and to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is the Mirroring Project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it later, but it's a project that I've done now for about 20 years, but it's changed. It's morphed quite a bit from when I first did it to the way that I do it now. And um, so I'm very excited to talk to you about it, find out if anybody here has done anything similar, and um, to share ideas. So as Karen said, um, Colleen Myers at the Center for Educational Innovation, which is, was formerly known as the Center for Teaching and Learning. So if you used to know what that was, this is our new name. Um, Okay, so um, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been teaching at the center, but I've work been working specifically with ITAs for about 30 years, actually over 30 years. Um, in 2007, I was awarded a Fulbright to go to uh, Turkey and to do teacher training, and specifically the instructors there were interested in how to teach pronunciation. And so I was there for a couple of weeks, and when I introduced the mirroring project, their eyes lit up and they said, wow, this is really fun. And so it was something that um, they found interesting and have subsequently um, adapted in their program. Um, I have given several presentations at um, TESOL on the mirroring project and on other things as well, and also um, at the PSLLT, uh, the Pronunciation and Second Language Learning and Teaching Conference. Has anybody here attended that conference? No? Um, I would strongly recommend that you go to the conference. Um, there have been a lot of people that are doing research in English as a Second Language, but they're trying to get more foreign language educators and researchers to attend the conference. It has grown quite a bit. There were a few papers this last time on French and German, and perhaps one on Chinese, but um, there's still a lot of room for growth. So again, I hope that you can participate. Or if you're working in ESL, um, that's great as well. And then also in terms of textbooks and articles, um, I'm currently in the process of uh, co-authoring a paper on, that relate to the proceedings of the last uh, conference. And um, it was on the intonation of a TED Talk, which relates to this project. So that's a little bit about me. So um, our agenda today, I have a hard time staying back here. I'm supposed <laughs> to stay back here, but I'd like to go out to the audience. So you're fine. Oh, wait. You're fine. All right. So our agenda today is basically we're going to do three things. First, I'm going to talk to you about the rationale. So um, why do this project? Uh, then how, so I'll be taking you through step by step um, how you would uh, work this project with students in your class. 
And then finally, tips for success, because there are some uh, caveats in terms of things to do or not to do in order to ensure a successful project. So um, first of all, I'd like to talk about why mirroring, and especially the way that I uh, do it now, because as I mentioned, it has changed. Um, but first, let me ask you, um, mirroring is where students will try to imitate um, a speaker in a video and um, imitate everything. It's called mirroring, and I'll get more into the details later. But not only the way the person sounds, but also exactly the way that they look, what they do with their face, what they do with their hands. Um, so how many people here have done some kind of a mirroring or shadowing project? Can you raise your hand? Great. OK, so about um, three of you have. All right. So um, later I'll be asking you two to share, um, if you feel comfortable, with others um, how the project has gone for you. But um, this is what I feel a very important way to approach pronunciation teaching. Because traditionally, um, at least in the 30 years that I've been teaching, we started out with um, techniques like listen and repeat, um, language that was decontextualized and form-driven, um, a bottom-up approach. So for example, in the many years that I've been teaching, we start with um, the segmentals, the individual sounds, maybe go into word stress. We don't get to intonation, rhythm and intonation until the end of the class. And so it's very bottom up. And we've only used native speaker models. Um, never anything other than a native speaker as a model. So that's been the traditional approach. But with the mirroring technique, um, and especially the way that I do it now, students start by viewing a video analyzing it and reflecting on the role that the person plays in the video. Because when we communicate, of course, we're um, trying to do something with our language. Maybe we're trying to persuade people. Maybe we're trying to educate. So um, we start with that. So the model is contextualized. It's meaning driven. It's more of a top-down approach. And as you see, as I show you an example, I'll talk about that. Um, but starting with, um, how is this person making meaning? And I'll show you an example where I used um, a non-native speaker. And actually, that was prompted by one of my students. At the beginning, when I started doing the project, um, I said, OK, everybody choose a native speaking model. And this one day, one of my students came forward and said, I don't want to use a native speaker as a model. I found someone, she's Chinese, and she found someone who was also Chinese that she wanted to mirror. And so that's how I got into this. And I'll tell you a little bit more later. So anyway, that's why mirroring. OK, so what is it? Um, here, in a nutshell, is um, the basic steps. And by the way, later I have a handout that I can give you um, so that you can have this information. But. Um, we first start by trying to diagnose what the major pronunciation challenge is that the student has. And I'll walk you through this step by step. Then students choose a model. And it's really important that they find the model. But of course, it has to be vetted by you as the instructor, because sometimes students will choose a model that's not really the best um, in a particular context. So it could be a scene from a movie, a TV program, a TED talk. Something like that, OK? Then um, it's very important that they start by reflecting. I'm a strong believer in reflection as a way to learn. And so I have them um, think about why this person would be a good model. What is it about this um, person's speech that they find attractive and doable in terms of being able to mirror? So that's the next thing. Then they analyze the speaker. And again, we'll go through this step by step. Um, not only what the person is doing, but also how they're doing it, how they accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Then they imitate every aspect of the speaker's delivery. As I mentioned, not only what the person says, but what they do as well. And then finally, they um, reflect on it. So again, it's a reflective process. 
So they end up reflecting on how their version compares to the original. Okay? So does that make sense so far? Yeah. By the way, um, I meant to say earlier too, this is going to be an interactive presentation. So a couple things. First of all, if you have questions, feel free to ask at any time. I'm totally open to <coughs> questions. The other thing is I'm going to be showing you videos and asking you to um, comment on them. So um, I will be asking you to participate because I feel like that's the way that you can um, learn how to do this the best. Okay? So anything so far? No? Okay. All right. Oh, question. Oh, well, yes. So have you done it with uh, like songs or anything like that? Um, no, I haven't done a mirroring project with a song. I've used songs in the classroom, but not mirroring. But that's a great idea. Have you in your um, teaching? I'm not a teacher. I'm a student, and I'm learning a language, uh, and I'm interested in music particularly. So, ah, okay. Um, and not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually we can talk later uh, about music. I'm also a strong believer in music for many, many reasons. Okay. So it would be fun to catch up with you yeah. um, and chat later. <coughs> okay, so what we're going to do is start with um, this student of mine. And um, she actually wanted to be called Mary, although she's Chinese. So that's not her uh, given name. And um, as I mentioned, I work in the ITA program, the International Teaching Assistant Program. So I work with graduate students that come from many areas of the world, and a lot of them are from China. And um, what we do is we have them give micro-teaching performances. And after the first one, we try to diagnose or figure out um, what their strengths and weaknesses are in terms of um, communicating in English. So I'm going to put you in this um, position. So the first thing is, what is she doing well? What does she need to work on in terms of pronunciation? And also think about and comment on her role as a TA on the first day of class. So imagine she's your TA. Um, how would you respond to her in terms of, um, is she coming across as credible, confident, is she um, warm and friendly? How would you characterize her? Okay? All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. This course is Accounting 2050, Introduction to Financial Reporting. Uh, I'm the instructor for this course. My name is Ren Ren Ma. I'm from China, and you can call me Mary if you can pronounce my Chinese name. Today, we're going to cover uh, two main topics. One is to understand the business. And after we have uh, mastered some terminologies and background knowledge about the business, we're going to briefly talk about the accounting system. OK. All right, so this is the next slide. So what I'm going to do is ask you um, in pairs to talk to the person sitting next to you, um, or form groups of three if you want to and talk about those questions. First, what is she doing well? Second, what does she need to work on? And third, how would you characterize her as the TA? Okay, so take just a few minutes and then we'll um, compare answers together. <laughs>
Characterize her. She looks very shy to me. To yes. That I don't know if the students will say, okay, whatever, she can do what we want. Exactly. Yeah. She doesn't look like she's in charge. She looks kind of shy. As you said, the students might say, oh, we can get away with whatever we want. <coughs> Anything else? She looks very nervous. She looks very, very nervous. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, all of this goes together to create this package that we have. And that's why I think this mirroring project is so important because pronunciation is more than just what comes out of our mouth. 
but the whole package, the whole nine yards. Okay, let's go back to the video, um, or go back to this. Okay, so then she was the one where I introduced the project and I said, okay, you need to choose a native speaker, here are some examples, but go to the web, see what you can find. And she was the one that said, mm, don't feel comfortable with any of these. Instead, would it be possible for me to choose Yang Lan? And um, Yang Lan is actually, is anybody familiar with Yang Lan? You probably know what she is. <laughs> okay, so she's what? How do they describe her? Yeah, she's the Chinese opera. Okay, and um, so my student found a video of the Chinese opera speaking, um, giving a TED talk. And so I'm going to show you the part of the TED talk, and then I'd like you to think about why do you think Mary chose Yang Lan? And do you think Yang Lan is comprehensible? Why or why not? Okay? The night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to host the final of China's Got Talent show in Shanghai with the 80,000 live audience in the stadium. Guess who was the performing guest? Susan Boyle. <laughs> and I told her, I'm going to Scotland the next day. She sang beautifully, and she even managed to say a few words in Chinese. Yeah. All right, <coughs> let's go back here. All right, so um, why do you think she wanted to imitate Yang Lan? What is it about Yang Lan? that's different from what she was doing. What are some things that you know? She exudes confidence. She exudes confidence. What else? She smiles. She smiles. What else? She what? She stresses words. Yes, her stress patterns are much, much better. How about her intonation? Flat? No. Nice up and down. Um, what else? What, what about the way that she's speaking? What, in terms of the content, she's telling a story, right? Mm -hmm. Stories are always engaging. And in teaching um, at the Center for Educational Innovation, we often talk about uh, with professors, faculty, and TAs, how stories can really enhance your teaching. So it's an important part of communicating with your audience. Anything else that Yang Lan is doing that might be you know, attractive? She, she has a lot of like pauses. Those pauses are really powerful. That was something that was totally missing from me. Exactly. Yeah, so along with um, Mary's flat intonation and lack of stress, Yang Lan is pausing at appropriate places. And this, of course, is very important in communicating, especially if you're teaching or giving a presentation, because people have time to think about what you're saying. OK. And what about Yang Lan? Is she perfect? No. What are some areas of her English that you noticed? She didn't do vowel reduction. Like she said, I'm going to Scotland, which I exactly. never say the two in the full vowel there. I'd always do a schwa, almost always. Yes. Yeah. So and she's I'm not going, doing. I'm going to Scotland. Yeah. She's not doing the reduction. But is that a big deal? I think she's well, using a British English yeah, um, as is. a power, I believe, a powerful tool. And we've got a colonization model there. And so, mm -hmm. you know, inherent or, or not. Yeah, so that's a good point too. She's using the, the British model there. Yeah. But if we're trying to um, teach her to reduce, she's, she's not reducing, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, certainly if she reduces, she's going to be closer to sounding like a native speaker. Well, it depends on what her goal is. If her yeah. goal is to sound just like a native speaker or not. Exactly. Well, that's the, the, the her goal in the ITA program, right. though, is to get into class as soon as possible. If I'm working on her vowel <laughs> reduction, she may be here for another couple of years. <laughs> so, um, yeah, good points. Okay, so um, why use a non-native speaking model? Um, can you think of any reasons why it might be advantageous? Actually, I just flashed it up on the screen. I don't think you can see it. <laughs> but, um, 
Why might a non-native speaking model be, in fact, better than a native speaker model? It seemed like it was more doable. Yeah. Like she could right. actually achieve that. Exactly. It might be more uh, achievable, more doable. Uh huh. In workshops and talks that I've given, sometimes I get non-native speakers that react very strongly to the idea that they should sound like a native speaker, right? They, mm -hmm. they like their identity and status exactly. as a non-native speaker. Exactly. So I think, you know, maintaining that identity of I am a Chinese speaker of English mm -hmm. is, is legitimate. And yes. so this gives them then a model that allows them to do that. Very important point. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? I'll just follow up on that. I think mm -hmm. sometimes it can be confusing if you sound too good. Then people get confused who you are and where you're from. Actually, mm -hmm. right? How you're mm -hmm. perceived is different too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there are all sorts of sociolinguistic aspects to this, right? Um, well, a couple of reasons that I came up with. Okay, the student looks like them, obviously. So somebody that um, looks like you do. They're excellent, but not perfect. So somebody that you want to sound like, but again. Um, it's doable, you don't have to reach this level that is unattainable. <coughs> Slower delivery sometimes um, may help, because sometimes I'll have students try to imitate a native speaker and they'll just say, uh, it's too hard. And so they get frustrated. And as we said, goal is intelligibility, not native-like. But I'm gonna add your point. I think that's really important too, um, what you brought up. Okay, so. Um, and actually, this was a change, as I mentioned, back in 2011. So I just wanted to quote John Murphy. Um, he's actually written on this and um, published about the idea of using non-native speaking models. And so um, I would like to encourage you. How many of you, by the way, teach other languages besides ESL? OK. So several. Um, I think it might be fun to try to do this sort of thing um, if you're teaching Italian or French or Spanish or uh, whatever um, and see how it goes. So it's not only for teaching ESL. Okay, so um, we've come to the part where we talk about how. So the first thing is analyze the speaker. So again, I start with the big picture. What's this person's objective? So in terms of Yang Lan, what is she trying to do? Persuade, um, teach, entertain, what would you say? Entertain. entertain, is that all? Inform. Inform. Yeah, and actually we might have to see her whole, um, her whole talk. I think it was something about, what was it in China? I think she was also trying to um, tell people about something, some change. It was going on in China. The young the youth in China and their use of social media. Yeah, it, right. So she was trying to um, make a point about youth in China and their use of social media. Okay, how does this person do so? So the next step is to um, go to a macro analysis. So pace and pausing, level <laughs> of, or formality of language, pitch variation, pronunciation and body language. Okay, so we kind of talked about this already, right? Pace and pausing, as Shonda mentioned, she's using more pausing um, than maybe you would in a conversation in a coffee shop. Um, her language use, would you say it's more on the formal end or the informal end? What do you think? The night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to the Ulster final. Yeah, more informal. And this is important because um, especially, I don't know about for you that teach um, second languages or foreign languages, but my ITAs sometimes come in and want to speak like a textbook because they look at their physics textbook and they start speaking like a textbook. <coughs> and undergrads can't relate to that. Plus, it makes it a lot more difficult because they come in and they say, how do I say this? And then there's like a 20 letter word. And I say, you don't have to use that word. Undergraduates want you to use this word that means the same thing. And then it's like, oh, okay. So um, you can really help your students by focusing on this level of formality and what's expected for the situation. 
Um, pitch variation, as we said, she's got a lot. Pronunciation was very clear, uh, in fact, so clear she wasn't reducing, as you said. And body language, facial expressions, etc. And then how does this person do it? Then we go to the level of analysis. And actually before, I sometimes started um, down here with this project, but now I start even bigger. So I have students transcribe just one section, seven to 10 sentences, uh, marked for the major pronunciation challenge that they're focusing on. So for her, it was thought groups, speaking in meaningful phrases, and finding the words that are stressed or emphasized. And then finally add the nonverbal communication. And I'll show you in just a little bit what that looks like. Okay? So does this make sense? Any questions so far? Or comments? Yeah. So if we, first of all, do you ask them to pick a speaker uh, among a certain number of speakers you give them, or they can go and find whatever they want and then they show it to you? They can find whatever they want and then they show it to me. Um, although I do have a list of about, well, I have a list that they start that they can use to start from. But if they find somebody that's not on that list, that's fine. The only thing is then I will um, tell them thumbs up or thumbs down. So for instance, um, one of my students um, who was actually from Turkey this one summer wanted to imitate an Italian speaker of English um, because she's a very good researcher. But the speaker um, had rhythm and intonation patterns that were such that I had a hard time understanding. And so I said, no, I don't want you to um, mirror that person. But then she was able to find somebody who was actually a Turkish speaker of English that was more comprehensible. For, for us, it's more like transcribing the seven to ten consecutive sentences. They might not understand what they're saying because they don't have the vocabulary. So if, mm -hmm. they, if they pick anything from online, sometimes they have a hard time understanding. Things. Yeah, so with your students then, if you've got lower level, you might want to um, narrow it down for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we just talked about this, her speaking objective, her macro analysis and micro analysis. Okay, then um, the next step is to mirror the original, stopping after each thought group, focusing on the spoken language first, then add body, body language and make a cold version. So um, at this point, Everybody can have a copy of this. Yeah. Okay, so um, what I have, let's see. <laughs> I'll actually have them write the sentences in a large font like this in thought groups with the focus word in bold and then write the body language above uh, the focus word. And one of the things, if you go back and watch this video, you can see that wherever she's putting emphasis or focus, she actually does something with her body. The night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to host the final of China's Got Talent show in Shanghai. You know, I can't do it exactly like she does, but it's something like that. And it's very, very clear that she's using body language to um, emphasize what she's saying. So then students will um, have their transcript like this, and then um, they'll practice with a partner. So I'm going to show you how to do this. Um, Again, I'd like you to get with a, another person, so work in pairs or groups of three. Um, and then, do you, would you mind volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> or actually, <laughs> sorry, I, since I've kind of uh, asked you. 
Okay, so then um, I'll have you all practice this. What you need to do is have the students, um, first of all, they might want to just mirror with the video. So they've got this, they play the video and they just mirror it. But then after they practice with the video um, enough time so that they kind of know it, then we want to put it into their um, free speech. So this activity will help. So what they do is they read one sentence, then look up and say it to their partner, trying to imitate the way that she did it. So can you do the first one? And you want to just look at him. Okay, so go ahead. Try to imitate what she did. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> it might be hard. I won't put you on the spot. I'll do it. So it would be it would be like like this. So the night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to host the final of China's Got Talent show in Shanghai. Okay, so it's important that you make the students actually look at the script and then look at their partner because you know what happens? Can anybody guess what happens? The students will sit there like this. The night before I was heading to Scotland and I was invited to host, they'll just sit there and they'll just read it like they always do. They won't make eye contact, they won't pause. And so you really have to get them not to do it that way because otherwise they're not going to change. It's really important that they use their script that way. Okay? All right. So does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So let's see the results. Um, and actually, I wanted to say one thing that's important. Notice I have cold version here. One of the things that I tell my students is that doing this project or working on your pronunciation is analogous to writing a paper. Nobody sits down and writes a perfect paper in the first time. You do a first draft, a second draft, a third draft. Okay, for this project, you don't have to do so many drafts, but you do a first draft and then a final draft. And so I call the first draft the cold version. And so you're going to see um, her cold version. Let's see. Oh, this we just talked about. Let's see. So the practice and tips I wanted to say, as I mentioned, um, going back to this here. Don't read. Um, it's very important to have large font so that they can memorize. Um, add the layers like an onion. So maybe the first time that they do it, they just focus on pausing. Maybe the second time they focus on pausing and emphasis. And then the third time they add the body language. So then that way they're not trying to do everything at once. And then um, try to add feeling to ensure the language supports the emotions. Because at this point they might just be saying it, but they're not thinking about, I'm trying to persuade someone. I'm trying to educate. Okay. So... Um, <coughs> Let's look at her cold version, and I'd like you to think about what improvement do you see um, from her micro-teaching one, and what does she still need to work on? The night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to host the final of the China's Got Talent show in Shanghai, with 80,000 live audience in the stadium. Guess who was the performing guest? Susan Boyle. She sang beautifully, and she even managed to say, say a few words in Chinese. Okay, so what is better than before? What has she improved so far? Gestures and body language. Gestures and body language. What else? Volume. Yeah, the smile. What? Intonation. The volume is... Intonation. Louder, the intonation is better. She has nice pauses. She has nice pauses. You can hear clear thought groups. What does she still need to work on? This is only her cold version, remember. So, fluency. She's kind of stumbling on her words. Do you have the feeling that Yang Lan does? She's getting closer, but it's still not there, right? Okay, so that's where um, what I have the students do is they upload their video to Media Hub or Media Mail, 
and we both critique it. I have the students critique their performance first, and then I come in and I add anything, and we talk about um, suggestions for how they can improve their final version. Okay, so as we said, just like a composition, this is her first draft. Okay, so now um, let's view her doing the final project and um, think about what's changed and how she's changed it. The night before I was heading for Scotland, I was invited to host the final of China's Got Talent Show in Shanghai with 80,000 live audience in the stadium. Guess who was the performing guest? Susan Boyle. And I told her, I'm going to Scotland the next day. She sang beautifully, and she even managed to say a few words in Chinese. So it's not like hello or thank you, that ordinary stuff. It means green onion for free. Why did she say that? Because it was a line from our Chinese parallel of Susan Boyle, a 50-some-year-old woman, a vegetable vendor in Shanghai, who loved seeing Western opera, but she didn't understand any English or French or Italian. So she managed to fill in the lyrics with vegetable names in Chinese. Okay. So isn't that wonderful? She, I think she just did such a fabulous job. And again, she was um, choosing, she chose it. Um, any comments? You look a little skeptical. Me? Yeah. No, I'm thinking. You're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So comments, questions, yeah. What's the time phrase here, like from video one to this video? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, I've written up uh, several like models, not really models, but uh, like a syllabus that you can um, follow. And I usually try to get this done in about two to three weeks. And, but we only meet twice a week, and one of those times we don't work on the Marion Project. So it's basically three hours, about two to three hours in class. So what they do is, um, as homework, or first of all, I introduce the project by showing them something like her and say, okay, this is the project you're going to do. Then um, they go home, they choose somebody, they actually have to write down on a handout who they chose and why. Um, then in the, next, in the next lab we meet, we talk about, or no, actually I will say yes or no before they get to lab. Then when they get to lab, they'll share with a partner who they chose and why. Um, they'll bring their seven sentences, and they'll start working with them, um, with me, with other students. Sometimes they'll work in pairs together. And then um, at the end of that hour, they'll make the cold version. Then they'll go home, they'll watch the video. I'll give them feedback. They'll give, give themselves feedback, and then they'll make the final version um, the following week. So that's a rough idea. If you want, I can share that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you have a question too? Oh, yeah. Um, I wonder two things. Do the students ever, with especially the, the set of what appears to be a, a valued um, set of body language mannerisms, do they report feeling uncomfortable? Gestures. Yeah, at first it's hard um, uh, for them, and in fact, um, but they also like it. Uh, at first in the program we might say something like, okay, you look very stiff, and they know that they do, need to do something different. And so we might say, well, try this or try that, and it's stepping outside their comfort zone. But having somebody like this, I think, is good because since she is Chinese, um, she looks like the student does, and the student had an easier time of, of using those gestures. I don't know, those of you, um, I would imagine many who speak another language, is it hard for you to take on those gestures? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you were learning English, um, 
was there anything that helped you to um, take on the gestures more easily? I try not to be like, embarrassed, <laughs> really <laughs> embarrassed, and I watch lots of movies or TV shows, then and I tried, even like by myself in my room. Mm -hmm. I was like, do it this. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, I like that. Yeah. yeah, but you're right, there is that barrier there. Um, but um, it seems to me that overcoming that nonverbal barrier also helps overcome the pronunciation barrier, because when you do the two, then you're sounding more uh, like a native speaker does, but, without going the whole way. But are those homogeneously applied across English speaking culture? Those gestures? I've wondered about that. Mm. That's a good question, are they? Does anybody know? You're saying. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. I think, I think well, it's very individual, but, but I, that's okay. But I think it's, I mean, this is right the first step, right? She's yeah. gesturing based right. on a, a model. So, you know, it's the, then a question of adopting. Which gestures you want for yourself? Yes. Which ones you yes. are comfortable with? Which ones you're not comfortable with? And in, in what context? Is it? Yeah. And you know, like for me, this is like a first step, and then you can go to those others. Yeah. Once yeah. you wear the differences. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you start noticing them. Right. Yeah. 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 I have the opposite problem. I teach Finnish, and I'm not a native speaker, but in Finnish, it's very difficult to find language. <laughs> so as an American, I have to teach myself not to do anything with language. <laughs> and do you tell your students? Absolute opposite. Yeah. Do you and tell it's your very students difficult. too? It's very difficult sometimes. I mean, some people mm -hmm. don't use their hands very much. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very like this. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, okay, freeze. <laughs> yeah. And don't smile, smile too much, also. Yeah. Like, so it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like dampening your American body language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do, you, do we get to. So I'm curious, do you have a video of her, like, doing her own thing now? Like, that's not copying somebody else? Oh, very good point. Um, I wish I did. I don't, but actually she's still at the university, um, I heard, because one of my other students is a friend of hers. So I'm going to get her. Of course, now it's been several years, and so you can argue that she's had lots of input from other um, people and other sources. But yeah, she still is here. But like, do that's the $64 million question that everyone asks, <laughs> that is there carryover from this to um, their free speech. And um, one of the things that I see, this is anecdotal, but I do observe that they use more body language, they use better stress and intonation patterns on their final exam. And their final exam is material that they get uh, 40 minutes before they do the test. They study the material and then they have to go in and they have to teach it to a group of graders. So it's a pretty high stakes performance test. Um, so, but yes, that's a very good question. And Elaine and I have talked about that as well and um, different ways of testing that. So, um, let's see. So, the summary, um, and then we can answer some more questions. So, the main thing that I wanted to emphasize today is focusing on the purpose and the tone of the segment and how these three um, aspects come into play. So again, the importance of nonverbal communication, the voice characteristics, and the primary pronunciation features um, that you're trying to work on. In her particular case, it was the stress, intonation, um, and the pausing. And then to guide the students through the choice. Again, I think it's important for them to choose the model. In fact, last semester I chose one model thinking that we would do two projects and we ran out of time for them to choose their own model. And I wish I had just done the one project where they chose it, although there, were, there are pros and cons. Um, and then the choice of models, um, consider the pros and cons of native speakers versus non-native speaker uh, models. So um, I think we have a you, well, maybe like one minute. <laughs> Other questions? Uh -huh. um, I am just wondering, I guess, um, so the students choose a bit their, their example. Uh, how closely do the examples that they choose uh, reflect, I guess, the challenges that they face? Or are, do the videos that you like 
do you provide a list of videos that kind of have a whole bunch of? Because this, like this student was focusing on thought groups and stress and intonation and stuff, but if a student has other challenges, do you find that they choose videos that are good examples of those transition well, issues? Or, I mean, you, you said to guide them through that process, but right. that's what it looks like. Well, yeah, <laughs> one thing is that um, I've got several handouts that I use to help them. So I've got one that's got just non-native speaking um, models. But also in the past, I have had some where I'll say, for instance, this person is good if you need to work on enunciation. This person is good for thought groups. But I don't have an exhaustive or extensive sure. list. Sure. Um, I find that having a list of good models fits most people. So for example, for her, if Mary had had issues with enunciation, Yang Lan would have also been a good model because she enunciates very clearly. As it turned out, Mary didn't need to work on that, but um, she's a good, Yang Lan is a good model for lots of different things. Does anybody here teach Spanish? Okay, I was gonna say, um, I'm a second language Spanish speaker, and one of the things, I haven't actually done this project, but I've tried doing it. I sometimes will watch um, telenovelas on TV, and, I'll, um, and I notice, especially in a lot of those, that they're really exaggerated with their body language and the way that they speak, and um, I've sometimes, I'll just sit there and I'll watch the TV and I'll try to mirror it. <coughs> I haven't actually done the whole project uh, myself, but um, I think it would be fun to do it, just to see how it, it would um, help me. So. Anyway, uh, that's all. If you have other questions or um, if you want to talk more, I'd be interested. I have a few minutes, not too long. But um, also, Marlene, did you want to say you're going to be posting the handout to the Carla website? Or how are they going to get the whole handout? Yes, we can do that. OK. I have a handout that's got links to all of the videos. And it's also got step-by-step -step um, how you can go through this project with your students. So Marlene is going to post it and then you can go there and you can click on the, the links and see them. I don't know, maybe if you wanted to use it with your class or just to look at it. Thank you so much. Yeah.